So the first thing I'm going to talk about today is the last thing I talked about on Thursday because I did not explain it very clearly on Thursday. I want to do it again, but properly without the time pressure that I had on Thursday. I want to talk about separated trees once more because I, I really rushed it last time. I think I did a bad job of that. Let's do it properly. It's not the most important concept in this course. Like it literally just comes up in this one theorem, but it is important. I feel I should do it properly. So for a Barnack space X, for X at Barnack space, whoops, and positive delta, an X valued L1 bounded Martingale, which we call F. And this is on some probability space with respect to some filtration. That's not important. This martingale is delta separated. If so, the the first value f zero has to be constant. So this has to be constant. Each element of the martingale, each f n, has to have finitely many values. or equivalently each Fn has to be simple. And for all N and for all omega in the probability space that this thing is based on, you have this distance criterion. The two adjacent values of the martingale have to be separated by delta. And the set I could say the range, I guess, the set S, which is Fn omega for all N and for all omega. This is called a delta separated tree. And the thing that I feel I did not explain properly last week was why this is called a delta separated tree or in particular, why this is called a tree. Uh, I drew a picture which was not very clear and I wanna to try to do it better. So the picture is this, you have your value of F zero, which is constant, right? And then you have your value, you have finitely many values of F one. Let's suppose F one has two values just for simplicity. So you'll have these two values Say we'll call them F1. What, what am I calling them? Picture here F1 of, six, of omega 1 and F1 of omega 2. So you can write omega as you can partition omega into two sets omega 1 and omega 2. And these are the sets on which F1 takes its two values. And F0, this point here is gonna to have to be the average of these two values because the expectation of F1 with respect to the sigma algebra A0, which I haven't defined, A0 is a trivial sigma algebra. This has to be F0 because F is supposed to be a martingale. A0 is a trivial sigma algebra. Uh, we're looking at a probability space here. A1 should I guess be the sigma algebra generated by omega one and omega two. It has to at least contain that. So this averaging property, F zero is the average of F one omega one and F one omega two. This is the martingale property applied to F one. Now F2 will also have finitely many values. Maybe it's got four values. This is the simplest case. So you can think, okay, suppose that F1 was equal to F1 omega one. So conditioning on this set, suppose that F1 has had this value. What are the possible values of F2? Let's put a value here and a value here. So this will be F2 of a set sigma one one. This is F2 of a set sigma one two writing sigma one as a disjoint union of sigma one one 
union sigma one, two. These are the subsets of sigma one on which F2 takes these two values. And you do the same thing over here. So you'll have two values, F2 of sigma two, two, F2 of sigma two, three. The picture's getting a bit messy, but I hope it's understandable. So sigma two is sigma two, one union sigma two, two. And these are the, the four values of F2 over here. And the fact that F1 of sigma one is the average of these two values and F, what is this one here? F1 of sigma two over here is the average of these two values. This is encoding the fact that the conditional expectation of F2 with respect to the sigma algebra A1 is F1. This is telling you that, yeah, the expectation of F2, if you know what F1 is and you condition on the value of F1, it is just F1 again. So if you know that F1 is this value, then the expectation of the possible values of F2 is the value of F1. So that's the Martin Gell property. And this is why the thing is called a tree because you can think of it branching out. I mean, it's actually a, a tree in the graph theoretic sense. You have these vertices, you have these edges, you're constructing a tree. And the you delta. Don't ask, hmm? sorry. You don't ask any relation between F2 and F0 other than what's implied, in particular. Other than what's implied, yes, because there are relations implied. Yeah, but no distance between F2 and F0. No, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, this, this value here, say this value of F2 could be close to F0. There's no restriction there. But if this value were over here, the, the diagram is getting very convoluted. Let me zoom in. <laughs> if this value were over here, very close to F0, then the other value would have to be over here. It would have to be further out to make this averaging work. Right. So you're thinking, could I possibly pack this tree so that everything was getting close together? You could pack half the values, but then the other half would have to go out. <laughs> You can't pack everything too small if your Barnack space doesn't have the right properties. So just to zoom everything back out, you have this mess of a picture. Yeah, the delta separatedness condition says that all of these edges here have length greater than or equal to delta. It doesn't say anything about the distance between this point and this point, only adjacent vertices. That's what a delta separated tree is. Basically, it's a way of thinking of the Martingale property as something geometric and combinatorial. You've got this embedding of a tree within your space and the edges have a certain minimum length, but also you have this, this averaging property. Yeah, I was the vertex, you look at all of its neighbors that come out at the next level, it has to be the average of all of them. Yeah, I was asking, it seems uh, some interesting Banner structure will arise when you have more vectors compared to each other. That's why I mean, I mean, in the, mm. uh, if you never compare F2 to F0, you naively think you just put everything on a scalar a line and then it, it will be hard for Banner space to do any worse than that somehow. Oh, but okay, maybe I should just- Turns out it can. There's a lot of room in some Banner spaces. Yeah, I know. So the, the, the Hilbert space would be the one, well, no, so it's, it, the Hilbert space doesn't even have the most room. You could even have more room. You can that. have much more room. Ah, no, This I get is it. all related to the Rudd and Nicodem property in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. if you want to think of bad spaces, you should think which spaces don't have the Rudd and Nicodem property. Okay, okay, good. C0, yeah. L infinity, yeah. Yeah. certain L1s. These yeah. are the okay. bad spaces. Yeah. Thanks, I'm working on my intuition here. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Oh, we all are, so yeah. Um, and yeah, this thing I said about every, this point being the average of these two points, that's because of, this is just how I'm setting up the Martingale. I mean, you can have a different probability space. You don't actually have to have equal weight on each one of these vertices. What should actually be happening is that the vertex is in the convex hull. Uh, it's, it's not the convex hull, it's a convex combination of the neighboring vertices. This will be a manifestation of the Martingale property, but this is getting a bit complicated, so we'll move on.
Now this proposition that I proved last week badly, I'll do it again. If X, if a Banach space X has the infinity Martingale convergence property, so every L infinity bounded Martingale has an almost everywhere limit, then X does not contain a bounded delta separated tree for all delta greater than zero. I should just mention by rescaling, if you find a bounded one separated tree, you can rescale the whole thing and you can get a bounded epsilon separated tree for any epsilon you like, large or small. The bound will change, but I don't say anything about what the bound is, just that it's bounded. So you can make that bounded set larger or smaller, fine. So really I could have just talked about separated trees without the delta, which would mean delta separated for some delta. Now let me prove this. We prove it by contrapositive, same as last week, but we do it more slowly. So proof by contrapositive, suppose X contains a bounded delta separated tree for some delta greater than zero. And from this, we need to violate the infinity MCP somehow, right? So suppose it contains a bounded delta separated tree S, I have to give it a name. Then by definition, S has to be the, the range of some Martingale. So S is the set Fn omega, N in N omega in omega. For some X valued L1 bounded Martingale called F. L1 bounded purely because that's part of the definition. Now the, the set S is bounded by assumption. We took a bounded delta separated tree. So since S is bounded, if you look at the L infinity norm of Fn, just being the essential supremum of the norm of values f n omega. This is of course less than the supremum of the norm of x for all vectors x in the set s because s is the range of f n over all f n. And by assumption s is bounded, so this is finite, yeah? So the martingale f is actually L infinity bounded. We assumed it was L1 bounded, but actually we have L infinity bounded because the set S is bounded by assumption. Now, since the this is a delta separated tree, we have that oops, Fn of omega minus Fn plus one of omega is greater than or equal to delta for all n, for all omega in the probability space. And since that holds the Martingale F can't converge. So just to be very precise, this sequence is not Cauchy, hence not convergent. And this holds for all omega not just for some omega, also for all omega. So we can conclude that the Martingale F has no limit anywhere. I'll say point wise, no point wise limit anywhere. So this tells us that X does not have the infinity Martingale convergence property, which is what we wanted to show. Remember this was contrapositive. So if does have if X does have this Martingale convergence property, then it doesn't contain any bounded separated trees. Any separated tree automatically has to be unbounded. 
And this is what you start to see with this picture up here. If I keep drawing this separated tree on the page, it has to start growing. You can put some points closer to the origin, but then you're going to have to put compensating points away from the origin and the thing is going to start to grow. Because the page, which is two dimensional, has the infinity martingale convergence property. Good. I hope that's a bit more clear than last week, because last week I just rushed through it and it didn't make sense even to me. Okay, so, so what we have is that we have this rudder nicotine property, which is the rudder nicotine theorem, but for vector measures. If you have a vector measure, which is absolutely continuous with respect to a, a scalar measure and so on, then this vector measure is actually a function times that scalar measure. There's some additional assumptions in there that I didn't mention. We proved on Thursday that that implies the one martingale convergence property. So this was Thursday. And we know that the one martingale convergence property is the strongest of those properties. And the infinity one, infinity martingale convergence property is the weakest. And we have P in between. So one MCP implies infinity MCP. And what we just proved is that that implies that there are no bounded separated trees. This is where we are right now in our big chain of proofs, big chain of implications. And we need to provide the last element of this chain that's implied by having no bounded separated trees and which implies the right on Nicodian property. And this involves the concept of a dentable set, which a few of us have been excited to, to talk about. So let's take a subset D of our Barnack space X. We call this subset dentable. If it has the following property, if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a point X in the set, such that I'm going to write a mysterious non-containment that I'll explain. X is not contained in the closed convex hull of the set minus a ball of radius epsilon around that point. What does that mean? If you haven't looked at the pictures in the notes, that doesn't make sense. If you've looked at the notes, as I suggested, very good. For example, if this is our set D, Is this set dentable? Let's fix an epsilon, which is small. And let's say, let's take this point X on the edge, supposing that the boundary is contained in the set, although just take a point near the boundary if the boundary is not contained in it. And take a ball around that point. Suppose this is epsilon. So this is the ball of radius epsilon around X. For example, if we take epsilon smaller, we have to zoom in. Now, if you take the, the set D and you take away that ball, so what you get is, I'll draw it properly so that my tablet doesn't erase it. There we go. This is D minus the ball of radius epsilon around X. So X is here. And now let's take the convex hull of that set. So our set looks roughly like this. And the convex hull says we, we take the smallest convex set that contains this set. So we add in this straight line here because convexity says that straight line is going to have to be in there because this point is there and this point is there. And we redraw it like that. That's our closed convex hull of this set. And X is over here somewhere, right? X is not in that set. So if we, if there's a curved bit in the set, you can remove that curved bit, make it flat, and the bit that was on the outside is not going to be there anymore. This is to dent the set. Um, I should give a small English lesson for the people who are not native English speakers here. The verb 
to dent means you get something like you get a car or whatever and you bang it and then it makes a sort of inside bit. I've translated it in German. It is, I think, Eindeln or Einbeulen. Can one of the native German speakers correct me on this? Is this correct? No one's complaining. It's good. Einbeulen seems more natural, but Einbeulen is also, yeah. Yeah, apparently Einbeulen is less common. Yeah. Einbeulen is a more common one. Um, I looked it up in Chinese, but my Chinese is horrible. It's, this, this is the first character, which is great because it looks like a dent. Second character looks like that. <laughs> Does this make sense to the Chinese speakers? <laughs> this is Alhen, I think. <laughs> good. No one's complaining. Okay, very good. Embarrass myself with my Chinese handwriting. This is dentability. You can dent the set. I feel it's important to know what this word means to understand the definition. Okay. Dentability says that your set has some curvature somewhere at the edge. This curvature doesn't necessarily have to be curvature. I mean, if you take a square in R2, this is dentable, even though this is not really a, a curved corner, it, it, you can dent it, right? If you take a ball around that, your convex hull will look like this and the corner is not going to be in there. That's a, a dent of a square. All right. So what do dentable sets have to do with martingales and rather nicotine property and so on? Before I get into that, I have to do a lemma. Just a little technical lemma. So let's fix our Barnack space. And let's fix epsilon greater than zero. Let's take a subset D. Such that for all X, X is in the convex hull, sorry, the closed convex hull of this dented set. So what this should be thought of as is that D is non-dentable at scale epsilon. So this dentability condition up here, there exists an X such that X is not in this dented set. This condition fails, at least for this particular epsilon. So for X, yeah, for a fixed epsilon, not all epsilon. If this holds, then for all X in this set D tilde, which is D plus a ball of radius epsilon at the origin. So this is an epsilon expansion of the set. Sometimes this is written as ball radius epsilon of D. You take every point in D, add a small ball around it. For every X in that epsilon, oh, sorry, I should have epsilon on two. For every X in this epsilon on two expansion, you have the same failure of the dentability condition, but with no closure in the convex hull. So in this dentability condition, we look at the closed convex hull. So actually you take the convex hull and then you close it. Uh, in this consequence of the lemma, we have no closure, which is gonna be technically convenient. Um, sorry, this should be epsilon on two. So this says that if you take a set which is non-dentable at scale epsilon and you expand it a little bit, then that expansion is also non-dentable at scale epsilon on two. And in a stronger sense, you don't need to take closures in this condition. Um, actually, no, in a weaker sense, because X could be in the closure of that set. <laughs> okay, let's call this weak non-dentable at scale epsilon on two. Wait, no, this is this is stronger. Never mind. I'm confusing everybody. Non-dentability says that X is not in the closure of this set. We're saying that X is not in this set, let alone that um, X is in this set. 
So it is also in the closure, but it's actually a little bit inside the set. Okay. This is just a technical lemma. Um, proving it is not too hard if you've got the proof in front of you. I guess reconstructing the proof is also not too hard. But just to get a little bit of practice of the dentability condition, I'm going to do the proof. So where do we start? We want to set, fix an X in this expansion of the set. So fix X in B tilde and write X as X prime, whoop, not X plus, X prime plus Y, where X prime is in D and where the norm of Y is less than epsilon on two because every point in this expanded set can be written in that way by definition. Uh, by assumption on the set D, this vector X prime is in the closed convex hole of the dented version of D at scale epsilon. So X is in this closed convex hole here. So there exists a natural number N, there exists scalars, alpha i between 0 and 1, uh, vectors xi in D, but not in the ball, radius epsilon around x prime. Uh, i is going from 1 to n. The sum over i of alpha i is equal to 1. This is what it means to be in a, a convex hole. And x prime is not in, actually, it's not in the convex hole, it's in the closed convex hole. So we can get arbitrarily close to x within the convex hole. So there also exists a vector Z in the ball of radius delta. Oh, I haven't said what delta is. Hmm. Just a second. I'm going to move this down because I forgot to quantify a number. Right. Fix delta greater than zero such that delta plus the norm of Y is still less than epsilon on two. Just a small delta. Norm of y is less than epsilon on two, so we can add a little bit and keep it less than epsilon on two. We fix such a delta. Okay, this can be moved back. So we want to get within delta, we want to find something in the, sorry, we're going to find a point in this convex hull, which is within delta of the point x prime. Delta is small. So we can do that. Uh, what do I want to write here? So there exist these scalars alpha i, vectors x i, and a remainder term z, such that x prime equals z plus this convex combination alpha i x i. Okay, now that makes sense. We wouldn't need this z if we didn't have this bar this closure in the convex hole. That clear? So now what can we write? So we have that X is by definition X prime plus Y. And using this decomposition of X prime that we have, this is now Z plus Y plus this convex combination of the X i's. And using that the sum of alpha i equals one, we can multiply Z by one and Y by one, <laughs> and we can write it like this. Alpha i, Z plus Y plus X i. When you expand out that sum, you see that, yeah, this is true. So what we've done now is we've written X as a convex combination of these vectors here. And what do we want to show? We want to show that X is in the convex hull of this, this dented version of D, this epsilon on two denting of D. 
So now we just need to show that the vectors z plus y plus xi are all in d tilde. Um, this should be d tilde up here. We're denting d tilde, not d. These vectors need to be in d tilde. Take ball of radius epsilon and two of x. Yes. I'd noticed, by the way, that in the um, when I wrote this in the notes, it was full of typos. I'm hoping none of the typos got propagated to to this lecture. <laughs> okay. So we need to show that yeah, these vectors here are in this set because then we can conclude that x is in the convex hull of that set with no closure, no remainder term. Right, so how do we do this? We know that xi is in D by construction. Where do we have that? xi is over here. xi is in D, which is in D tilde. So that's a start. And the norm of z plus y in x by the triangle inequality, that's less than or equal to the norm of z plus the norm of y. The norm of z, where's z defined? z's defined up here. The norm of z is less than delta. And where is y defined? Well, okay. Y's got norm less than epsilon on two, but actually we define delta such that delta plus the norm of y was also less than epsilon on two. So this is delta plus norm of y. And that is by assumption less than epsilon on two. Yeah. So this tells us that Z plus Y plus XI is in D plus ball of epsilon, ball of radius epsilon on two, which is D tilde. That's the first thing we needed to show. We need to show that this vector is in D tilde, but also not in the ball of radius epsilon on two around X. So now we should look at the distance from x to this vector. We want to show this is larger than epsilon on two, larger than or equal to epsilon on two. So let's rewrite this as x minus y minus z minus xi. And x minus y, what can we say about x minus y? Look up here x minus y is x prime. So that's x prime minus z minus xi. We use the triangle inequality, but backwards. We get x prime minus xi minus norm of z. I always get a little bit confused when I use the triangle inequality backwards in this way, but it is true, you can check. Now, what can we say about these things? X prime compared to XI, what do we know about that? Uh, how are XI's chosen? XI was chosen not to be in the ball of radius epsilon around X prime. So the distance from X prime to XI is greater than or equal to epsilon. And Z, we have a minus Z here. What can we say about the normal Z? Okay, it's less than, less than delta. So let's say this is greater than epsilon minus delta. And what do we know about delta? Delta is less than epsilon on two because delta plus the norm of y is less than epsilon on two. So delta is certainly less than epsilon on two. So this here is greater than epsilon on two. That tells us that z plus y plus xi is not in the ball of radius epsilon on two around x which was the other thing we needed to show. Remember, this is what we need to show up here. So we're done. Since that was a, a quite technical lemma, I think it's a good idea to go back and just have a quick look at what we proved. We had a set which was non-dentable at a given scale. And if we expanded it by that scale divided by two, then that thing is in a stronger sense, non-dentable at pretty much the same scale. So what this is going to let us do is take a set which is not dentable and let us ignore the, the closure in the convex hull. 
that's what this is all about. That closure is annoying. How do we remove that closure? That's how we do it. And we're going to prove things about non-dentable sets without really caring about the scale. So we're going to say, okay, if it's non-dentable, it's non-dentable at some scale. And then the expansion is non-dentable at a slightly different scale. And then we're going to work with that. Good. So then what can we prove now? Can I prove this before the break? No. <laughs> Can I prove anything that would not need to be? Does anybody have any issues with the break starting slightly later? Does anybody desperately need to use the bathroom or something? Okay, nobody's gonna say so if they do. Feel free to leave mid proof if you do need to. We're gonna prove a theorem. Given the Barnack space X, suppose that for all delta greater than zero, X does not contain a bounded delta separated tree. Then what can we conclude? Every bounded subset of X is dentable. Which is a nice miraculous looking theorem here. If X doesn't contain any sets of a given form, then every bounded subset has to have a certain form. This looks like a miracle, but of course, when you look at the contrapositive of this sort of statement, there's no miracle involved. If there exists a non-dentable bounded subset, then you're gonna construct a bounded delta separated tree from that. It sounds plausible. We prove the contrapositive, as I just said. Uh, we suppose there exists a subset D of X, which is bounded and non-dentable. And we're going to show that there exists a bounded delta separated tree, actually a delta separated tree in this set or in an expansion of this set. So since this set D is non-dentable, there exists a scale epsilon such that the set is not dentable at that scale. So such that for all X in the set, X is in the closed convex hull of D minus a ball of radius epsilon around that point. So by the lemma that we just proved, we have for all X in the expansion, the epsilon on two expansion, X is in the convex hole with no closure of that expansion minus the ball of radius epsilon and two around the point, as we just proved. And now this is gonna be handy Let's construct a delta, well, not a delta separated tree, an epsilon separated tree in the set D tilde, which is bounded. Because D tilde is just an epsilon and two expansion of a bounded set, it's bounded, of course. And as I said before, rescaling that epsilon separated tree will give you a delta separated tree for any delta you like. It'll just change the bound of the set. Now let's take our probability space. We need to construct a, a separated tree. So we need to construct a martingale to get that tree. Let's let our probability space be the unit interval with this Borel sigma algebra and the vague measure. And we're going to construct a martingale, an epsilon separated martingale inductively. And by inductively, I mean, I'm going to show you how to do it. And you're going to have to trust that you can do the induction proof. We're not going to do it very formally. I'm just going to show you how to do it. 
So first let's fix a point X zero in D tilde, just arbitrarily, doesn't matter what it is. And we set F zero to be constantly equal to X zero. So remember in our condition, in our definition of an epsilon separated martingale, we had that the first term was constant. So here's our first term, doesn't matter what it is. Now we know that X zero being in this expansion of D and because D tilde has this non-dentability condition, we know that X zero is in the convex hull of D tilde minus ball of epsilon and two at X. So we know that. So there exist numbers alpha one up to alpha n between zero and one. Uh, summing up to one. And there exists vectors x1 up to xn. These are in d tilde, take away this ball. Ball at x0. And all of this is such that x0 is the sum over i of alpha i xi, just by virtue of being in a convex hole. And this is why we needed to get rid of that closure. We don't want any small remainder term here. We want an exact expression. And we know that X zero minus all of these X i's is greater than epsilon on two because X i is in the ball is not in the ball of radius epsilon on two. I realize now I made a typo. We are constructing an epsilon on two separated tree, not an epsilon separated tree. So how do we get a martingale from this? Let's partition the unit interval zero one into intervals. Let's call them I, I, I from one to N such that the length of the interval I, I is alpha I. We can do this because the alpha I is sum to one and the unit interval has got length one. Let's let a zero, we have to construct a filtration as well. So A zero is the trivial sigma algebra and A one is the sigma algebra generated by the II's. I should probably say I from one to N here. So a function is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra if it's constant on each of the intervals. And from that we define F one to be the sum over I of the characteristic function of the interval I I tensor with the vector X I. So the X I's we constructed before, basically we're taking this representation of X zero and creating F one from that. And these sets here have measures corresponding to these numbers. So are we constructing a Martin girl here? We have to check that. The expect the conditional expectation of F1 with respect to A0. Oh, A0 is a trivial sigma algebra. So this is just the expectation of F1, the average. And the average of F1 is just the sum over I of the measure of the set II, which is alpha I times the vector XI. And this is X0 by construction, which is constant equal to F0, so by construction. So the expectation of F1 is F0, which is a good first step in constructing a martingale. And the other important property is that F1 of omega minus F0 of omega is greater than epsilon on two for all omega in the unit interval because of this property up here. So we clearly look like we're constructing an epsilon on two separated martingale, except that's only the first step. We've constructed F0 and F1, but this is the, the induction scheme. Given Fn, we're gonna construct Fn plus one in the same way. So since each Xi, so we have X1 up to Xn, each Xi is actually contained in the expansion of D we can repeat this inductively. So 
So what did we do? We had x0, which was in the expansion of D. And then we wrote it as a convex combination of points in D that were far away from that point. And we constructed the martingale from that. Well, not the whole martingale, but we constructed a function, a random variable from that. We can repeat this. So we represent xi as a convex combination Uh, I won't give the vectors names because it'll be confusing, but a convex combination in the expansion minus ball of radius epsilon and two centered at xi now. We use this representation to define the function f2, but only on the interval ii, where xi is the value of f1. But we do this on every one of those intervals. This is like this picture of a separated tree I was drawing at the start of the lecture. We specify the values of the function given the previous values. So we specify the values of fn plus one given the values of fn, which is a very probabilistic construction. The, prob the probabilists are certainly fine with this. It's not something you typically see in analysis, but probability, certainly you see this. So we define f2 on ii and so on. If you have fn defined, you've got values of fn, and for each of those values of fn, you split that into a convex combination and define fn plus one on that set, and you do it for each set. So this gives an epsilon on two separated martingale valued in, that's well, valued in x, but in particular, it's valued in d tilde. All of the values are within D tilde. You never leave D tilde in this construction. And this is a bounded set. What does that tell you? X contains a bounded separated tree. And that's what we wanted to show. So just before the break, a quick reminder of what we were approving. If X does not contain a bounded separated tree, then every bounded subset of X has to be dentable. Contrapolative being, if you have a non-dentable bounded subset, you can use that to construct your bounded separated tree, which is a pathological object that you shouldn't be able to construct. And that's why when I drew these dentable subsets up here, that's why I couldn't draw a non-dentable set <laughs> without it being unbounded. <laughs> I can draw a non-dentable set. You imagine like this is your plane R2 and you just take a half plane that has to extend all the way to infinity. That's non-dentable because if you take a, a chunk of a ball out of that and you take the closed convex hull, you get back the same half plane. But necessarily once the set is bounded, it has to have a corner somewhere or a curved bit and that's where you can dent it. Yeah. Okay, we'll take a break. Are there any questions before the break? Well, I suppose the converse to that theorem is also true, right? Every delta separated tree is a non-dentable set. Every, is every one necessarily? I guess I think so, so because all, 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 well, okay, no, I'm again having in my mind, if all the points are delta, I mean, all the points in the tree are mutually delta away, then that's clear because then every small ball contains yeah, only yeah, one yeah. of these points and then that yeah. point is, is the... Uh, yeah, well, this is basically color. saying if you have a discrete, every discrete set is dentable. But even, one... without, even without this assumption, I think you can always write one point as a convex combination of the two uh, following points, which must be far enough away to be outside of this ball. Um, hmm. I, sorry, I wasn't paying enough attention when you said that because I just thought of a counterexample. What so, were you saying? So you, uh, when constructing this martingale, you have to split up every point into some number. In this example, yeah. it was always two. It could be more of different yeah. points, all of which are at least uh, delta away. Yeah. And so if you take out the ball of radius delta, those points will all still be in there and the convex combination will give you the old point. Yeah. So it isn't uh, non-dentable. 
there are apparently counter examples or examples of Banach spaces where you have the you have no bounded delta separated trees where the martingales are restricted to have a certain number of values at each point. Like when I drew the delta separated tree, I drew what's called a dyadic delta separated tree. Every point splits into two other points. And to write this theorem here that X does not contain a bounded delta separated tree, then every bounded subset of dentable you need to have separated trees of arbitrarily many splittings at each point. If you restrict the number of splittings you can have at each point, this theorem is not true anymore. Yeah, but this is not, this does not hold for the converse. This is for this direction, right? Yeah, yeah, that's this direction. So I think the converse should always be true. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, you could take any, take any small ball it's gonna take away possibly lots of points of your tree, but for every point it takes whack away, the immediate children of that point are not taken away, and the point is the convex hull of these children, right? Here is the, by the way, the counter example I wanted to show. If you consider just the, just Z sitting inside R2, or inside R even, this discrete set, uh, this just this set's not dentable because it's contained in a line and anything contained in a line can't be dentable because if you remove any part of it that's not the whole set and you take its closed convex hull you get the whole set back in fact you get more than that you get you know a, a line back and you could construct a martingale whose values were all integers which was which is one half separated but then its image is not going to be dentable. Unless I've made some mistake somewhere. I just thought of that on the spot. So I don't know whether that's a valid counter example. This is a... No, no, we are trying to prove that every delta separated tree is dentable. Right? It is not dentable. It's not dentable. Yeah, we try to prove any delta separated tree is not dentable. So you think is not dentable, right? Ah, yeah. I'm confusing myself. <laughs> At the moment, I can't see anything wrong with uh, our. No, I think I just got confused. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should have the break. <laughs> maybe discuss this after the next lecture before we confuse everybody. Because <laughs> I'm already a bit confused. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>